Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Beyond LED Lighting, Take Control of Your Energy and Your Space Now. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by Acuity Brands. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items with you. Please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions in the question box that's in that panel. You can send your questions in at any time, and your speaker will address them after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the control panel. So please be sure the panel is expanded so you can access the question box. And if for some reason our speaker does not get to the question, to your specific question, they will certainly be addressed uh, after the event directly. So if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send us a message via that question section as well, and we'll address that right away. Now I'd like to introduce your speaker today, Justin Moon. Justin is the Director of Industrial Vertical Marketing at Acuity Brands, and that's one of the world's leading lighting controls and daylighting manufacturers. With over 10 years of experience in the lighting industry, Justin is focused on bringing innovative solutions to industrial facilities in a sustainable, energy-efficient manner. A strong advocate for the role that advanced lighting systems play in enabling optimized solutions to improve facilities' return on investment, maintenance, and quality, Justin works closely with Acuity Brands R&D and product design teams to ensure the company is leading the industrial space through technological advancements, evidence-based design principles, and the voice of customer insights. So with that, I'll hand it over to Justin. Hi, Justin. Hey, Ann. Thank you for the, uh, the warm reception. Welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great afternoon. I'm excited to talk with you today and to go beyond LED lighting uh, with ways to take control of your energy and your space now. So without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Whoop, there we go. Got PowerPoint working all good right now. So we're gonna try to weave this around a story of keeping the end in mind. And of all the seven habits from Stephen Covey, uh, this one resonates uh, the most for me. And I think it's a great place to start as we think about this journey uh, that we're going to go on today and what you want from your facility and your operation. Right? In five years, what do you want from your facility? How do you want it to be meeting your business needs now and in the future? Knowing where you want to be enables you to create the right plan uh, to get there. So what is the end? Where should you ultimately want to be in regards to your facility? What we think it is, is a facility-specific data-driven operation strategy that enables you to reduce expenses and increase functionality. Now, those are a lot of uh, $5 words in there to really kind of explain. You really want something that's tailored to your facility, that's going to be data-based, and that is a holistic strategy basically to reduce expenses and uh, make your facility function better. So let's break this down into a quick scenario and show you what that looks like. So in the end, you have the data you need to make exceptional business decisions that could save you big bucks. And this data would be given to you in easy to use dashboards like you see on the screen, right? Some overlays of showing you the facility, data that's gonna be showing you trends and different data points across the facility. And ultimately those dashboards are gonna give you insights uh, into your energy usage, maybe your utilization, maybe what your specific systems are doing across the facility. But that's what you're really going to be looking for is the data is going to be leading you to some insights. So take the ones that are up on the board there. So conference room one is in use 85% of the workday, but Rob's office is in use only 10% of the workday. So those are great insights that the, the data can give you. And so from there, you're able to take the insights and create a strategy uh, to achieve some meaningful results. In this case, now that you know that Rob's only in his office 10% of the time and that you're utilizing your meeting space a little bit more than you probably should be, you could turn Rob's office into a collaboration room. That's going to achieve some interesting results right, out, right away, right? You're going to reduce the wasted property spend of not utilizing all the space to the best of your ability and you're going to increase some opportunities for teamwork some collaboration around the office 
And I think from what Acuity has seen, um, we've done this a couple uh, times so far in our building, it actually does make the workday a little bit better when you can pop into a collaboration room and really get some stuff done with some teammates. So this uh, facility data-driven operation strategy starts with data and ends with the results that impact your bottom line. So how do you get there? Well, like any journey, it's good to keep in mind the end, right? If that's where you really want to be, that's good to keep that in mind, right? Because sometimes starting a journey can seem daunting, you know, especially if you focus on just the beginning. Um, a good example of real life is, you know, driving to the beach with your family. You know, if I focus on the beach, then the fact that my kids are terrors in the car and always ask me, are we there yet, suddenly becomes a little less annoying because I know I'll be on the beach soon and they'll be preoccupied uh, annoying somebody else. So that's what it is getting to that facility specific strategy. Fortunately, it's not as terrible as kids in a car. Uh, there's some cool stuff that you can do along the way. But as we step backward, you got to look at the steps necessary uh, to get to the end. And that's where we got to keep in mind where we're headed. So the first one, pretty straightforward step, uh, convert uh, two LED fixtures. Thanks, Justin. And with that, I believe we have a poll that we'd like to ask our attendees to answer. Have you upgraded your entire facility to LED lighting? Please select one, yes or no. We'd like to see what our audience uh, is up to. Okay, so in a few moments, the results will pop up on your screens. And no, I have not upgraded entire facilities to LED lighting yet. So uh, there you go. Thank you very much for your votes. And back to you, Justin. Thanks, Ann. Well, that was pretty cool. I like to, like to have the polls like that. So again, right, converting to LED fixtures, step, step one. There's no shortage uh, of information out there to show you the benefits of converting to LED. Right, Facility Executive itself has hosted a number of different webinars uh, over the years on the topic, and I believe there's a high bay lighting knowledge channel on their website that details uh, some great benefits, especially on the high bay lighting side. So how do we summarize all of that content into basically one idea? Well, that's pretty easy. LED saves money on energy and maintenance and is the digital backbone to realizing more from your facility. So let's look at each one of those in a little bit more detail. So no surprise here, LED lighting saves big on energy, right? In a lot of cases, that could slash it up to 65% less uh, energy spend when you upgrade LED. And that's big dollars that you can realize instantly. So thinking about some of the industrial spaces, you know, if you have a, a six lamp T5 uh, HO high bay using 365 watts, you know, a, com a comparable LED fixture can use anywhere between, you know, 100 to 120, just depends on some of the options. And so you're looking at 265 less watts when you convert to LED. Multiply that by 250 fixtures in a space, and it's, a, and it's pretty much a no-brainer on how much you're going to save uh, right off the bat. Number two is that LED lighting saves you big on the lighting maintenance as well. In fact, LED lighting in some cases can eliminate most of your lighting maintenance spend altogether. Again, that is serious savings up front. You know, I have numerous examples on the industrial side, but think about your own facility, whether it's industrial or, you know, education or something else that's out there, of how much that you spend on sending somebody maybe to change out lamps, um, you know, an industrial, or you're renting scissor lifts going up 45 feet up in the air to change out a fixture or change out lamps and ballast. Those costs can really add up really, really quickly. You know, I had a, a T8 bulb out above my office. Uh, it took a few hours to get somebody over there, but still, you know, the maintenance guy had to walk over, you know, probably spend an hour of his time coming out and changing out one bulb. Again, it's those little things that add up over time uh, that LED lighting eliminates. And then control. You know, it is the digital backbone to achieving more. You know, the levels of control afforded by switching over to LED enable you to customize light output and save money while doing it. So not only are you saving energy, 
not only are you saving on maintenance, uh, but LED lighting gives you enormous amounts of control that really sets that foundation uh, for some of the control strategies we're about to jump into, and as well as some of the operation strategies, and again, getting you to that end in mind. So that's why you start with LED, right? Beginning isn't so bad after all. It's pretty easy. You're going to save some money doing it up front. So step two on the journey to the end is to implement controls. There are several lighting control strategies that you should definitely implement in your facility to save and to optimize. These strategies will lay the groundwork to achieving more in the end, as we discussed a little bit ago. So what are uh, six strategies for you to implement? Let's look at uh, each one of those a little bit. So the first one's gonna be occupancy sensing. Second is daylight harvesting. Third is auto scheduling. Number four, load shedding. Number five is gonna be task tuning. And the final one is a building management system integration. So now that you know what the six strategies that you should be implementing in your space um, with LED lighting, let's look at a little bit more detail in each one. If no one is in the space, why pay to light it? That's essentially the question that occupancy sensing uh, is going after right there. It's pretty straightforward. The sensor turns lights off or dims them when no one's in the space. You know, think about the back of your warehouse or another area where if nobody was there, why are you paying to light it? The key here, and this is what a lot of customers that I've heard from is, is that you don't have to have the lights actually turn off. You know, I've heard from many customers, you know, the saying, hey, I can't use sensors because I'm a 24-7 facility, or I can't use sensors because I can't have my lights turn off. The great news uh, with occupancy sensing and the sensors today is that you can choose any percentage you want to dim the lights to when the space in, is unoccupied. If you need 20% light for safety, no problem. If you want to maintain 50% of the normal light when nobody's in the space, that's easy to do as well. Programming the sensor is simple. Typical savings from this strategy can range, as you see there, anywhere from 15 to 55% on average. But I've seen this go a lot higher in certain areas of the facility. In some cases, going back to that back of the warehouse example, Right. If you start turning those off or dimming them down 80% of the time, you're going to jumpstart that savings even more. And this strategy is easy to implement across every area of the facility. Think of your offices, restrooms, hallways, aisleways, even outdoor spaces. Think about your facility. What areas could use a sensor? Heck, I just put one in my son's closet because he never turns his light off. And then now I've got about four more that I'm going through my house. And I'm going to put a sensor in every place where a child isn't going to turn the light off. Number two, daylight harvesting. So if daylight is available, why use artificial light? Again, that's an important question uh, when it comes to this strategy. So basically, daylight harvesting automatically regulates the use of electric lighting in a building in response to the amount of daylight available. So say you want to keep 30 foot candles in your area at all times. The sensor would read the amount of natural light coming into the space and then adjust the electric lighting to maintain the 30 foot candles at all times. Cloudy days will use more electric lighting to maintain the 30 foot candles, while sunny days will use less electric lighting and so on. As you can see the example there, you know, a cloudy day, the sun is providing 40%. Now your electric lighting is providing 60%. You know, clear skies, looks like your, your daylight is providing 70% while your electric lighting is providing 30%. So average savings can be between anywhere from 15 to 45%, but really it's the power of off that is so attractive about this strategy. There's probably a ton of opportunity where the daylight will actually provide all 30 foot candles in the space and so you could have your electric lighting off so really the possibilities are somewhat limitless when you factor in the strategy 
one bonus is that you could combine the occupancy sensing and the daylight harvesting strategies by using a combination sensor, right? That's the perfect way to combine these strategies together to maximize the savings quickly. Again, think about your own facility. Where should, where could you be implementing daylight harvesting? You know, could it be in an office space that has some good natural light coming in? You know, what about your open areas where you have some skylights? Uh, think about that. Where should you adopt both at one time? Again, it's really simple to combine these strategies and make sure the sensor is doing all the hard work and, and saving you as much as possible. So that's number two, daylight harvesting. So number three, auto scheduling. So if tasks vary based on the time of day or other time-based business patterns, you know, why not look at a scheduling strategy? This gives you that time-specific control of your lighting, equipment, even HVAC systems to really go after those savings. So in other words, you're really going to base your lighting's behavior on the time of day as it applies to the shift schedule or other factors. This is a great way to automate energy savings by controlling the desired light levels throughout the day or night without really wasting electricity. And again, looking at the example on the board, hey, when everybody comes into work at 6 a.m., 100% on, we're going to have a nice bright area. But, you know, when lunchtime rolls around and you've got different shifts and different departments going to lunch, you can dial it back, you know, maybe to 80%, maybe to 90%, really capture some savings there. And then at nighttime, you could dial it back down to 20% or have some of your other strategies take over to, to regulate the lighting. It's easy to set up the multiple schedules, switch between them based on business factors, right? If you start running a third shift or you factor back down to a one shift, it's easy to kind of flex with the times of what you need to do. What I like best about the scheduling strategy is the subtle little things that can be tried and managed that save 2% here or 3% there of just little tweaks that you can make throughout the day. And then that's how those savings really stack up to be between 10% and uh, 40%. So that's number three. Let's check out number four, load shedding. So what's a smart way to reduce the peak pricing or comply quickly with a utility's demand response request? The load shedding strategy is great for this, right? It reduces your energy usage temporarily, either automatically based on that demand response signal coming from your utility or using this manually to potentially reduce some of your expenses. It's a way to selectively reduce the load of the system to avoid times of peak energy pricing, such as when demand for air conditioning during times of extreme heat outpaces the utility's available energy. Mid-afternoon hours, for example, might be ideal for dimming lighting to reduce the energy drain while still providing the adequate, if not ideal, lighting for building occupants. You can employ this strategy to reduce your demand-based charges as well. If your demand charge is set at certain times of the year, you can employ the load shedding strategy to effectively reduce your demand charges and therefore save money for the entire next year. We've actually seen a couple of customers do this strategy where they knew what time of the year the utility would set their demand rate. And so they came in basically for the, the previous couple months and started employing this strategy so that their demand charge would be set lower thereby saving saving them for an entire year on that charge, right? If their demand charge is going to be set at 15 kilowatts an hour, they effectively use this strategy to get that reduced to 10 based on some of the things that they did. And that saved them for 12 months on end. And it was, it was a great uh, kind of out of the box way of using this strategy to save some money. Typical savings anywhere you know, 15 to 45 percent, depending on you know how much you stretch this strategy throughout uh, your building space. Number five, task tuning. I really like this one because this is where you get to really tune the area to really go after certain areas of the space and what's actually being done in the space. 
So if your tasks vary throughout the space, you know, why pay for uniform lighting, especially uniform overhead lighting? So task tuning means programming the output of an individual or group of fixtures to the level that provides just the right amount of light for the, spa, uh, the space, task, or area. Think about areas where task lighting is providing the bulk of the lighting in the space. So a task tuning, you can then go in and adjust the overhead lighting or the area lighting to maybe 80 to 90% while utilizing the task lighting to get everything done. Think about sometimes in manufacturing plants, you'll have a strip light or some type of low bay over your production area or over the manufacturing cell or over the workbench, and that's providing the bulk of the light. You'll be able to then come in and say, hey, you know, right over the, the workbench or the maintenance area, I want to dial back my high bay lighting maybe to 80% and really utilize the task lighting to get the work done. So again, this is one of those great ways to easily squeeze additional savings out of your lighting system. And again, think about your facility, right? If you're having some office kind of work, maybe you've got lamps or some other task lighting there, you can dial back the overhead lighting at 80%. Maybe in the warehouse, you can dial it back down to 90%. You know, maybe in your manufacturing area, there is no, there is no task lighting. You need the, the high bay lighting to be providing 100% of it. So looking at number six. So enabling your lighting control system to integrate with your building management system helps centralize these functions and reduces energy consumption, meaning even more savings. So with today's technologies, these two systems really are designed to work together. What's more real-time data, such as the occupancy status, helps you optimize your space based on usage. So the strategy of occupancy sensing goes beyond just controlling your lighting, and the same sensor can now help save energy on lighting and your HVAC, leading to greater energy savings as well as occupant comfort. And we'll talk more in a little bit about, again, what that strategy of occupancy sensing uh, can do for you. But really, once you start tying these in, it really goes above and beyond, right? Now, in an occupied area, not only will your con lighting control strategies take over, but now you know, hey, I need this occupied area to be maintained at 72 degrees. In my unoccupied area, I can bump up uh, to 80 degrees until I sense the, the people coming into the space. So one more time, as a recap, here are the six main strategies that can help you assert control over your lighting and energy spin and integrate with broader building management system to help you save more in other areas as well. Thank you, Justin. Uh, again, we have another poll, our uh, second poll, and there it is. And we'd like to ask you all out in the audience to cast your vote here. And the question is, how many of the control strategies are you implementing that were just discussed? None, one to three, four to five, or six? That means you're a rock star. So occupancy sensing, daylight harvesting, auto scheduling, load shedding, task tuning, and uh, building management system integration. How many, if any, are you uh, implementing to date? Please let us know, and we'll show those results in a few moments. Okay, thank you. So 61% are doing one to three. Uh, followed up, Justin, by 18, four to five, 16, none. And 4%, we have 4% rock stars out in the audience today. So there you go. Thank you very much for uh, sharing that with us. Thanks, Ann. Well, wow. four percenters, I'm proud of you. That's, uh, that's great. It's good to see some people implementing some great stuff. So we are nearing the end. So who's still with me, right? The end is near, I promise. So far we've talked about LED lighting and we've talked about those six important control strategies. But now we get to talk about some fun stuff that can truly give you more data to make better business decisions beyond just controlling lighting and HVAC and will get us to that end strategy. So I promise the end is near. 
So remember, we said the M was that facility specific data driven operation strategy. And there are two such ways that you can implement this uh, ASAP. The first is kind of broad, all encompassing energy management. And the second is space utilization. The best part about both of these is they work hand in hand with the LED lighting and the control strategies to leverage the components and data in new ways. So let's check out energy management in more detail. So do you know exactly where your energy is going at all times? Energy, it's a necessary expense, right? We've, we've looked at some of the ways that LED is gonna save you energy and some of the controls, but this can spiral out of control pretty quickly when you start leveraging everything that uses energy. On average, 60% of energy spend in a typical commercial building is on lighting and HVAC. And I would say precise energy usage is largely unmeasured, knowing exactly what is being used on every device in your facilities is largely an unmeasured thing, but that's gonna be in the past. So we've all heard the saying, you can't control what you don't measure. Well, that's exactly what the energy management dashboard is all about. Giving you the precise measures you need around energy spend so that you can control. You need to see the different load types of the building, right? Your lighting load type, your HVAC, your plug load, potentially your machines. That's pretty easily to do, quickly and easily to set that up. Do you wanna see different floors in a building along with the total spend of the building? You can see that in the dashboard as well. Do you need a way to do sub metering to tenants? You know, within this dashboard, you can do that as well. Really, the dashboard gives you that accurate data on consumption and help you identify the usage trends and saving opportunities. Now you can make data driven decisions about your energy spend. So we've done this in a number of our facilities um, at Acuity. And again, that's what we were able to kind of see is, hey, in our plug load consumption, you know, has gone up or down. This is what this floor was able to do. This is what this floor's total consumption was doing. This is what our, you know, our building uh, in Indiana was doing and so on. So it really gives you that data to really dive deep and understand, you know, where the spend is going. So again, you can make some good strategic uh, tactics and then get some good results. So a quick application, right? Looking in this dashboard. So floor, you'll see in the dashboard, hey, floor one's consumption has gone up 25% uh, since last month. You know, in this particular application, you were tracking your different load types. So floor one's plug load consumption is the root cause. So you're able to give your maintenance crew some direction to go down the stairs and say, hey, was something new installed? Was there something new installed on the floor uh, that we didn't know about? And then you can make uh, the decision to go from there and what you're able to do. And think about what you could do here, right? If you could look at the different floors, if you could look at different buildings, if you could go into your warehouse and say, man, you know, my forklift charging station uh, is starting to uh, use a little bit more because, you know, something's been faulty or, hey, the energy consumption's been fine, but now my batteries are not uh, quite charging all the way. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of ways that this data could be used in a lot of cases as some predictive indicators of things that could go wrong that your maintenance crew can get uh, out ahead on on some proactive maintenance instead of reactive. The next one is the space utilization. So what do you know about your space? To me, this is one of the more exciting data streams available to truly help your space out right now. So again, what do you know about your space? Well, I could tell you that right now the space is your highest business cost after your employees. Think about how much you spend each year on the following, your employees, your space, and your energy. We've seen larger numbers spent 
obviously on employees in space per year than on energy. So this is a great way to now that you have reduced your energy spend with LED, you started controlling it more of those strategies. Now you got a broader base look at it with the energy management. Now you can take all that data, put it into some of the space utilization and really start managing expenses that go beyond just your energy. On average, 60% of the office space is unoccupied and yet we're still paying for it, right? We've seen this uh, with studies across the board. You know, especially the ones we've been running, you know, we've already converted a half dozen offices into what we call pop-up collaboration rooms in order to utilize our space better. You know, not to pick on our HR department, but I walk by the office every day and no one is ever in there. So now it's easy to identify that and then determine what's the best way to use that space, right? Can you um, maybe have some temporary uh, office space for employees that aren't there, you know, 100% of the time and now all the offices can be some of these collaboration rooms and that you can get more done in certain projects. So that's what we're finding with some of these strategies. And then again, before space uses usage, excuse me, uh, is largely unmeasured by owners. You know, before, you know, a lot of this data was uh, aggregated in the way it is today, maybe you had to go out and do, a, get a consultant to do this work, a bunch of Bluetooth sensors, or utilize some non-lighting occupancy sensors. There were, there were ways to do it, but it's a lot easier today. Now the strategy is uh, simple. By using these sensors already deployed for your occupancy sensing strategy, you're able to get the real-time spatialization data segmented by groups, zones, or all the way down to individual rooms. So you identify the current peak and average utilization. You could view trends for zones or for the individual sensors. You can manage and compare multiple buildings, multiple floors, and different space types. You can find the under and over utilized areas within the space. You can also enable the meeting management to see real-time availability, book meetings from the dashboard, see room amenities all ahead of time, and then you can understand which amenities are really driving the usage. So looking here, you could see that in this space that we were doing at our headquarters, right, our current utilization was at 80%, our average was at 56%, and our peak was at 84 and then we were able to drill down and look at the different uh, meeting rooms that we had, the different floors, and identify, you know, wow, nobody was really using our library room two. Um, everybody was using pretty much our library room one instead. You know, how do we shift some of that over? Do we need to create another uh, collaboration room on that side of the building? So you're really able to see what exactly is going into the space. And then that way you can really start making some exciting uh, decisions with that. So looking at a couple of different examples that it can give you, right, floor one is used like 92% of the time is what we saw in one area, but floor two was only used about 60%. So we, you know, how do you move some of the people around to floor two? Do you need to create some more of that meeting space? You know, do you have too many people on floor one? And so now you're able to kind of leverage what you have across that building by looking at the floor plan, looking at the real-time data, the trends over time of the different conference rooms, all the way aggregated up to the different floors, and then able, able to uh, make some good decisions going from there. And then looking at the meeting management in addition to the spatialization, you can see that presentation room, you know, it's got a smart TV, video conferencing. Conference room three holds 25 people. But I see, hey, room six is available from two to five and it's just in a normal room. So now you're able to look at it and say, you know, I really don't need uh, the, you know, the presentation room with the smart TV. Conference room three is too big for me. I just need conference room six. I'll go ahead and grab it from three to four. You can do the 
hold the meeting right there. You're done. You got it. Got it done. And now you're utilizing that space a little bit more efficiently. I actually was doing this the other day and, you know, had a meeting room scheduled, walk down there, there's people in it. So naturally, you know, it was an important meeting, so I couldn't kick them out. So I had to go find another room, uh, which basically meant I had to walk around instead of kind of logging into, you know, a meeting management type of thing like this. And so that's what we're hopefully going to do as well. So we've reached the end, but I do want you to think really quickly about where you are in that journey. It sounds like we've got some rock stars that have already implemented all these six strategies, but where are you on that journey, right? If, if uh, most of you are in that one to three category, it sounded like of implementing some of the control strategies, you got about three more that you can implement in addition to what now you could start doing on the operation side. You know, the rock stars, your next step is start getting into that broad base energy management. How do you leverage the data that you're getting to really go beyond your lighting and HVAC and start doing some of the spatialization and solving some of those bigger problems? So wherever you are, there's always room uh, to go up and to continue to do more in that space. So with that, looks like we finished... Uh, a little bit early, which is good. Now we got more time for questions. Real quick, you could learn a little bit more about all of these uh, solutions. Go to acuitybrands.com. If you have any specific things you want to email me directly about that we talked about, my email is up there on the screen right now. Justin.moon at acuitybrands.com. I appreciate everybody's time today. And Ann, we'll go into some QA time. Great. Great, thank you, Justin. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, we covered a lot of ground there. Um, yes, I do have a question that uh, uh, harkens to the to the beginning of your presentation, uh, and it's before making a decision on an LED uh, replacement, how do I find out how much energy use I'll save with LED? Uh, are there tools that I can access, whether in the industry, uh, industry wide, or from Acuity? Absolutely. So Acuity has a number of different calculators um, that from simple to more complex ones that really show you how uh, the energy savings in addition to maintenance savings and even what some of the control strategies will do. Some of those are located on our visual website. It's a visual-3d.com. There's a simple payback tool. Really, you input the number of hours that you spend, how many fixtures, your current wattage. So let's take a, you know, that three, six lamp T5HO, 365 watts is what you put in, LED replacement of 100, 100 watts, and it will pretty much magically tell you how much you're going to be saving. Uh, we'll have another kind of simpler calculator coming out here in the next couple of weeks uh, that'll be up on the webpage as well that gives you the specific payback if you have a six lamp T5, a six lamp T8, and a 400 watt of what the LED replacement is going to be in basically the click of two or three buttons. Thank you. And okay, another question has come in about sensors. Uh, is this is is there a retrofit sensor system available? And if so, how much rewiring is required to implement it? So I'm trying to think through, I, let me answer some of the question. And then what I would ask is the person who did submit it, send me a quick email or I'll, I'll, I can get your information. We can email back and forth on the full answer on the retrofit side. Uh, a lot of these sensors are going to be using uh, Acuity's InLight protocol uh, for the space utilization side. You know, if you want to get into just obviously the occupancy sensing and daily harvesting, you know, those those kind of already exist. But getting into the advanced spatialization, we do connect those up through our InLight system. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do that with some of the Cat5 cabling and sometimes with some, I would say, retrofit stuff, kind of like power packs that you can get it in. So it makes it pretty seamless. Uh, but in some cases, there could be some additional wire to be run. Thank you. 
Uh, so along those lines, uh, here's another question of, uh, you had talked about integrating into an existing building management system. Uh, can you just give an overview of how do your products integrate into an existing building management system? Uh, what does that involve, generally speaking? Uh, there's a number, so a lot of our solutions, especially on uh, the DISTEC control side, are backneck capable. So the Enlight Eclipse backbone that uh, is run mostly on the Enlight network is a uh, backnet IP capable. And so now that uh, you have that onto the network, you know, getting up into a secondary BMS network, now that you're you know, backnet capable makes it a lot easier having, you know, there's less things that you got to run and less software that you have to do. So essentially using the Enlight Eclipse, it's somewhat, I'll use this term loosely, a plug and play type of model of integrating with um, some BMS uh, systems out there. Thank you. And the software that you mentioned that showed the measuring energy usage, et cetera, that you had that you had shared, mm -hmm. is that software for data management available for smartphones? You can access it through your smartphone. I need to check on the app side. I don't know if we have an app yet, but getting it on an iPad or an iPhone, I mean, it's a pretty intuitive um, software. It's not, it's not necessarily PC, based uh, software so yeah you can access it from your smartphone it's just a basically you just log into uh, the url of the system and then you're able to see it so you know, really it's not it's not a pc base where you download it and and it's only managed through there okay so so it fits with the mobility of a facility manager or their team yes. okay understood yes okay great uh okay so then um Okay, you, you talked about the six different control strategies and uh, how they work well together uh, for maximum efficiency. So, but is there is there one control strategy you would start with if you only had it in your budget to pick one? Hmm. I would. So, if if you didn't do any, and especially you know coming from more from an industrial background. It would definitely be the occupancy sensing and really that you can combine both occupancy sensing and daylight essentially into one component into that sensor. So you really be getting two of the strategies uh, for the, basically the price of one. That's essentially where I would definitely start on the industrial side. You know, a lot of cases that savings that you're going to get from a sensor are going to be huge in comparison to what you're paying for it. Uh, and then that's where it really gives you the opportunity to build from there because now you're saving, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent by turning your lights off or dimming, dimming them down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so how effective is control, our lighting control strategies through the Ethernet? Uh, I guess that's versus wireless. Uh, is, is that anything that you might comment on? Sure. So. You know, you have the, obviously the wired versus wireless approach, and there's certainly opportunities on both. Uh, you know, um, I like to think about it in industrial um, as opposed to some of the other ones, right? So in a, let's take a warehouse. You know, would you go wired or wireless in a warehouse? Well, you're already, you don't really want to run Cat5 in huge long runs like that in a warehouse, because now you're, you know, the cost of installation outweighs the cost of what the wireless is going to be. So for those large open areas, you know, wireless is going to be the way to go on the manufacturing side. When you get to the office side, um, sometimes that wired versus wireless approach, you know, the, the runs are going to be a lot shorter on wired. Plus, you know, systems like uh, Acuity's Enlight has been out there for 10, 12 years already. Um, so that's where you need to look at, you know, wired is kind of already ingrained to be wireless is becoming even better now on the, maybe some of the office side with Acuity's Inlight Air platform that really gives that commissioning jump starts that going. And so that's really the, the strategy of looking at, Hey, like, which one do I need and what type of space on the indoor kind of office area? I would say an industrial side is going to be wireless all the way with things like uh, Acuity's X-Point Wireless. Thank you. 
And okay, let's see. Oh, can you comment? Do you know the rollout schedule for Title 24, um, state by state? Uh, can you comment on on any of the scheduling as far as what's expected with that across the country? I do know. No, I can't comment with 100% accuracy. I do know that the IEC type codes are adopting more of what Title 24 was going after. Uh, I do believe Texas was one that just implemented a much more stringent Title 24-like code that was recently implemented. That's the only one I know offhand. Uh, there's some stuff on Acuity site that um, talks a little bit about what the energy rebates and also some of the energy codes are going to be doing over time. And that's certainly stuff that we're we're watching as well. Uh, I think we have a few maps and stuff like that, so I can I could probably follow up uh, and get some information to 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 whoever's asking. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and I think that's all the questions we have at this time. So I do want to thank you, Justin, uh, for your presentation and for for going through the uh, questions with me. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate the opportunity. Hope everybody has a uh, great day. Wonderful, wonderful. And of course, thank you to our audience for sending in your questions and for your attendance. Uh, I also want to let you know that to learn more about this topic today, uh, I'd, I'd invite you to visit the Acuity High Bay Lighting Channel, and that's at facilityexecutive.com. And there's a number of interesting tools there uh, that may also address some of the questions that you all have and, and uh, elaborate on what Justin's talked about today. So in addition to that, we, a recording of this webinar will be available online at facilityexecutive.com also, as well as on the Acuity Brands website, and that's acuitybrands.com. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great afternoon.